So hi everyone, my name is Brian Armentrout with the Food Leadership Group and it's my pleasure today to talk with Sean Stevens. Sean is a global food safety attorney with the Food Industry Council and Sean and I met recently at the SQF conference and he spoke about some of the requirements of what's going on under FSMA and all the new legal requirements especially around what's known as the Park Doctrine and frankly what he said during his presentation was different than what I thought. And him and I spoke a little bit afterwards and he blew me away because there's some subtleties here associated with this that you may or may not understand that the senior leadership in your company needs to know about. So I cornered Steve and I'm, I'm sorry, I cornered Sean and was able to ask uh, him to come on the call today. So very excited to have Sean talk with us here today. So Sean, welcome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation and uh, glad we could chat a little bit this morning about uh, Park. So definitely, can you give a little bit of background on the Park Doctrine? So one of the things that we talked about was the background on what this Park, park Doctrine came from. Right. So um, in the 1970s, the FDA was um, doing um, uh, inspections similar to what might happen today. Um, but it, the agency really needed additional tools besides um, civil sanctions against companies to enforce uh, its food safety regulations. So um, the FDA, in part and parcel of its enforcement activities, looked to the concept of bringing criminal charges against corporate individuals or managers within an organization that just continuously refused to um, follow the food safety regulations. So in, 19, um, in the 19, early 1970s, uh, Park, um, John Park, was the CEO of Acme Grocery Stores. And it was a very large grocery chain with um, nearly a thousand stores up and down the uh, east uh, coast. And Acme had a number of very large distribution centers from which it would send product out to these grocery stores. The FDA uh, was tasked or responsible to inspect those uh, distribution centers. And during one inspection, it found evidence of rodent droppings, rodent activity uh, on the floor near a pallet of cased product. Now, there was no evidence that the product itself had become contaminated, but it was being stored in the vicinity of an area where there was obvious rodent activity. The FDA responded by writing a Form 483 in an observation um, criticizing the company for storing food, what in essence was uh, in sanitary conditions. Um, the 43 was then, like almost happens in any case, uh, addressed to the CEO, John Park in this case, of the company. John received that 43 showing that the FDA had these observations and he handed it off to his vice president of food safety and quality to, to, to take care of it. Right. And the vice president of food safety and quality handed it off to uh, the facility manager to take care of it. Well, um, some things were done, but not enough. When the FDA um, came back three, three months later, they still found um, evidence of rodent activity in the same area, although it had been improved. There was still evidence of rodent activity. So the FDA, um, very displeased, uh, brought a misdemeanor criminal charge against John Park for failing to rectify that insanitary condition which was um, existing in his distribution center. John Park responded and in his defense argued that, well, he shouldn't be liable because he delegated um, the responsibility of fixing that condition to his vice president of food safety and quality, who in turn delegated it to the facility manager. And the jury, after a jury trial, disagreed. They convicted him of failing to remedy that situation. Uh, Mr. Park ran it up all the way to the Supreme Court, making the same arguments that he should not be liable um, criminally um, for failing to correct the condition because he delegated it. And the Supreme Court, after deliberating, um, agreed with the jury and upheld the conviction of John Park and, in essence, creating the Park Doctrine. And um, what the Park Doctrine um, says is if a corporate executive or a food safety manager within a corporation um, is aware of a condition that could lead to the adulteration of product. In this case, it was in sanitary conditions where the product is being stored. And that person is in a position to fix it, which Mr. Park was. And that person fails to ensure that it's fixed, which in this case he did. Um, then that person can be held criminally liable um, with a misdemeanor charge. And this is now known as is the Park Doctrine. Interesting. So, devil's advocate here. So, okay, fine. This is something that's been around since the early 70s. Why is this important now? Why should I care? 
Right. So um, after the FDA had its victory uh, in the Supreme Court, um, the doctrine pretty much stayed dormant for many, many, many years. There really wasn't any circumstance that rose to the level that the FDA had to use or was even interested in using criminal charges to uh, enforce uh, or compel compliance. Most recalls, for instance, well, all recalls um, are voluntary in nature. Mm -hmm. The FDA now has the ability to mandate that a company um, initiate a recall. But um, history has taught us that in almost every instance, a company faced with um, um, a um, concern from the agency with respect to a food product will, in virtually every case, make sure that that product is, in fact, um, recalled. With FISMA being passed, right, it sort of changed the game and it changed the dynamics. Um, the FDA was tasked um, with, in essence, overhauling the safety of the food supply. And the agency understands, and I think rightly so, that simply creating regulations and forcing companies to go out and, and create written food safety programs and, and comply with the regulations themselves, right, at least in the short term, probably isn't going to have any objective um, effects, right, on the safety of food. So the agency was looking for creatively some tool that it could use to sort of push food safety, you know, this, this, this goal that it has, push it along a little bit faster and almost insert and compel, right, um, companies to do more, more quickly to ensure that the food that they're producing is more safe. And the tool that the agency found was, you know, laying back in 1975 with a whole bunch of dust on it, the Park Doctrine, and it, it picked it up and blew the dust off <laughs> and said, aha, we can bring misdemeanor criminal charges against executives and companies that um, aren't doing enough under FISMA to make sure that the food that they're producing is, in fact, safer today than it was yesterday. Interesting. So... Does this specifically apply to then, so you've mentioned the 483, right? So a 483 is if FDA has findings during an investigation that they want to cite you for, they can and you need to respond and there's all mechanisms behind that. And those are addressed to the person in charge, in this case, the CEO. So if I am, let's say, the CFO of the company or another senior leader within the company, can I be held liable under this as well or is it just the individual that's named on the 483? Anybody within the company who okay. has knowledge of the condition uh, who is in a position to um, fix that condition and who doesn't take action could be um, could be held liable under the Park Doctrine. And I'll say, um, you know, we mentioned this concept of a misdemeanor charge. Well, a misdemeanor charge, um, as as you know, isn't quite as significant as a felony charge, um, but it has um, um, uh, very sharp teeth, so to speak. So a single um, single misdemeanor charge, and if we look at Bluebell as an example, it you know assume it was shipping out you know a million ice cream cones a month. Um, every ice cream cone it shipped, if the FDA believed that they were contaminated, could support a misdemeanor charge, right? So that's a, a million charges, perhaps, right? Oh. Um, but where where it gets tricky for corporate executives and managers is that single misdemeanor charge can support a sentence of either a year in prison or a two hundred fifty thousand dollar fine per ice cream cone. So um, the agency has an incredible amount of power and deterrent effect by using the uh, Park Doctrine, bringing misdemeanor charges against companies um, and and getting getting convictions. And I'll just note, um, you know, when we think of criminal charges and we look at a felony, for instance, the government has to prove intent that I intended um, to hurt somebody or I intended to do something bad. I was aware of the circumstance. I was aware that my action would could lead to this result. And I intended to get there. Mm -hmm. Misdemeanor under the Park Doctrine doesn't have that intent element so the government doesn't have to show that I knew that that product was in fact contaminated or that I knew I was shipping adulterated product. All it has to show is that I was aware of a condition that could possibly lead to the adulteration of product or the shipment of product that was um, that was adulterated. So wow. as described by um, DOJ, this is a strict liability standard. Um, which means the government does not have to prove intent. It just has to show that the CEO or the CFO or the COO um, or anybody within management was aware of that condition that could have led right to adulteration or people getting sick, were in a position um, through whatever capacity to fix it, and that they failed to act.
Wow. So that burden of proof then on the government, Sean, is very low. So, I mean, it's, it's way down there. It's just like you have to, you were made aware of it because of the 483. You failed to act. Therefore, bam, here's, here's right. how we're going to act. So a jury would be told element one um, was um, John Park aware of the condition? Yes or no? Yes, he was. The 43 was addressed to him. Now, maybe he didn't read it and it, it went across his desk, right? It was addressed to him. Um, number two, is he in a position to fix it? That's pretty easy, right? Um, it's not hard to show that corporate executives or management are in a position to fix a problem within a food facility. And number three, did they fail to act? Well, if, for instance, the company shipped product and somebody got sick, that proves the government's last element. Um, so it, it is a very low uh, burden of proof that the FDA shoulders um, when using the Park Doctrine as a tool. Wow. So you had mentioned the Department of Justice a little bit ago, and we've seen some re recent issues in the news where Chipotle and Bluebell, as you had mentioned, where the Department of Justice has been pulled in. I'm not really clear on it. Can you explain a little bit more of how that works? How, so FDA has an issue, and then, then you see something in the news around the Department of Justice is investigating. How does that linkage work? Right. So there's a very close partnership that has been forged between FDA and DOJ. Uh, Jeffrey Steger um, with DOJ is currently leading the charge on the, the part of DOJ and working very intimately and closely with FDA. And the, the new policy is um, under FSMA moving forward. If a food company, and I call this the human illness standard, if a food company sells product into commerce and that product is associated with human illness. So with Chipotle, we saw a cluster, a number of outbreaks and human illness uh, with Bluebell, there were um, nine illnesses stretched over the course of five years. Whatever the case may be, if there's human illness associated with that company's product, the FDA will, um, in virtually all cases now, uh, initiate a criminal investigation against that company in partnership with DOJ, requesting emails, um, food safety decisional records, documents from the company, and then look through those documents to see if there is a basis right, to support a criminal charge, most likely using the Park Doctrine that we just talked about. So if our products, um, whether we know we're shipping adulterated product or not, if our products are, despite best efforts, contaminated and causing illness, um, we should expect to be the subject of a criminal investigation in turning over all of the records um, uh, from our company. Wow. I mean, just as a side note on that, it it's just shows the importance of in companies why it's important to have really clear and concise document control programs and record retentions, both written and emails now, right? Yep. So to make sure that you're maintaining that correctly and archiving or destroying at the appropriate intervals. And having worked in the industry for quite a while, those things are very difficult to uh, enforce and make sure people are following correctly. That's right. Absolutely critical. Um, the way we respond to food safety issues, positive environmental findings, we find listeria in a drain or salmonella, how we document that, how we um, uh, articulate our corrective actions is incredibly important. We need to do it with an eye towards what the elements of the park doctrine are and make sure that we're shielding ourselves. Um, the way we communicate with email, I do a lot of training with uh, companies uh, and C-suites about how do we make sure that our employees are communicating appropriately using email when we're talking about some of these issues so that, um, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is if you write it down, a jury's going to read it, right? So how do we protect ourselves? And um, communication training, I think, is essential. Corporate leadership needs to be aware of it. We don't want to create inadvertently a record within our emails or communications or our documents that if our products are associated with human illness, DOJ comes in, gets access to them, um, they suddenly have enough evidence to support um, a criminal criminal charge. So yes, right. corporations should be very diligent. Well, and definitely. I mean, during during you know class one human illness type situations, there's tons of information flying around. A lot of it is speculative. People are putting assumptions out there relative to things that may or may not be supported by the data. So those emails that are written in that context at that particular point in time um, may not be accurate information. That's right. And they can be misused or interpreted in uh, many different ways. And I'll say there's even more, right? Uh, corporate executives should be worried about when we talk about DOJ access to our records. Chipotle is a great example. Their issues were in late 2015, but DOJ requested every email and food safety document from the company from January 1st, 2013 mm -hmm. through the present. So two and a half years of emails before the company even had an issue. So um, we need to be extremely diligent um, with respect to how we're communicating within our organizations, not only in the midst of a crisis, but also on a daily basis. Oh, absolutely. 
So, all right, Sean, I'm, I'm a VP of QA in a company. I understand this and I get this. And I'm watching this video and saying, holy crap, I need to make sure my organization understands this. Do you have any recommendations of how to effectively communicate this information up through the organization so the CEOs and the CFOs and these guys understand it without imparting an over, um, you know, gloom and doom, sky is falling type <laughs> view? Right. You know, the best example, the best tool that, that I've found that my colleagues in the industry um, have, have found success with and I found success, success with is just pointing to some of the more recent examples. Um, we mentioned Chipotle, yeah. uh, Bluebell, um, Dole, Packaged Salads. Yeah. These are all companies that were very sophisticated. Um, by all accounts, they were doing things right, or at least they believed they were doing things right. Um, but yet, with the, the Park Doctrine, this new standard, um, believing that you're doing something right um, isn't necessarily anymore enough. Companies need to be taking um, more steps to um, make sure that the programs are sufficient, the results that their programs are designed to get are the right ones and that the company is taking appropriate actions in response to food safety issues. Um, and if a VP of QA delivers this message to its CEO and says, listen, I don't want to, we don't want, we're not necessarily doing anything wrong here, but we don't want to be like Dole or Chipotle or Bluebell. You know, let's, let's start a dialogue and have a conversation about internally within the corporation, um, what might we be missing? What conditions might exist that we might want to just divert a, a little more resource to to make sure that we're fully protected? Absolutely. Yeah. And the best way to do that is to test your system. Right. right. So people do mock recalls in plants all the time, but I really don't see companies that test their crisis management system. And that usually doesn't happen until it's December 23rd and you get a recall notice from a grocery chain and all of a sudden you have to activate this system and you're not ready for it. That's right. You know, um, when uh, I call it leaning forward in the food safety foxhole, <laughs> if our if our crisis management plan is one or two pages and that's it, we probably have a problem. Um, I'm a big advocate of uh, decision trees mm -hmm. um, and I have a number of tools that I use decision trees to help companies navigate right in the midst of a crisis. If this, then this. Right. And it, it, responding to the media, responding to the government, making the decision whether or not to recall, making the decision how much we're going to recall if, in fact, we do um, and protecting right communications within that that context. Um, so, um, yes, it you know, when a recall, when we get that call from FDA at 430 on a Friday before Christmas is when it usually happens, um, we need to be pulling the trigger and executing on our plans not spending hours or days trying to figure out what our plans are. Absolutely. So, I mean, really to kind of bring this back around then, so with FISMA, the way this has all changed then with the systems is, so FDA has essentially partnered with the industry and said, okay, we're entrusting you to create food safety plans that are robust and protect the food supply. We are going to come in and judge you on that ability of whether or not you were successful in doing that. If you have a recall, well, that's pretty good proof that that didn't work appropriately. And we're going to use the park doctrine if we feel there's sufficient evidence that you didn't act appropriately to address that. And we could take action against your senior leadership or others within your company. That's right. That's right. I think you summarized it um, very aptly. And I would add, um, in addition to those circumstances where a recall triggers a visit from FDA, we are also now seeing the agencies when they visit food facilities, taking microbiological swabs swabbing the environment, the floors, the drains, um, equipment, and looking for pathogenic strains, which they're then matching against uh, 15 years of data in the PulseNet database, the CDC's database of human illness, and trying to see if any of those human illnesses over the course of the last decade or so match the bacteria in your facility. And if it does, um, I can assure you that DOJ and FDA in those cases will do the exact same thing launch a criminal investigation into um, that company's operations to see why their product made somebody sick a week, a year, or five years ago. Absolutely. Oh, that's a very good point, right? And then using that database to go back in time at cold cases to look at past illnesses to see if those originated from your company as well. Hence, DOJ also going back and asking for emails a couple years back. Mm. That's right. That's right. So food companies, in addition to making sure that their programs on a going forward basis are adequate, um, really need to um, do more robust testing in their environment, 
try to find any bacteria that might be in their drains or on the floors before the, the government does and tells them what's there um, and take action now to get rid of those microorganisms that could be in the environment that could connect that company to an illness that happened a long time ago. So um, a lot of new, a lot of new risk for corporate um, executives in our food industry to consider. Definitely. Well, I mean, Sean, this is exactly why I wanted to get you on the call. Super important information. Uh, I, we could probably talk for another hour on this, but I easily. Mean, yeah, <laughs> this is really helpful. So if people want to reach out to you and get more information, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, visit my website, uh, foodindustrycouncil.com, or just give me a call, 920-698-2561, or my email is stevens at foodindustrycouncil, uh, C-O-U-N-S-E-L, as in lawyer, foodindustrycouncil.com. Fantastic. Thanks, Sean. Really appreciate it. And once again, this is Brian Armantrout with the Food Leadership Group. And I can be reached at Brian. I'm sorry, B. Armantrout at foodleadership.com. My web leadership is foodleadershipgroup.com as well. So thanks, Sean. Appreciate your time. And we'll talk soon. It's been a great discussion. Thanks, Brian. Awesome. Thanks.